We are rolling. All right. So I have the honor tonight to introduce you to Paulette Epstein, who is the Planetary Manager and Staff Astronomer at the Michigan Science Center. She, uh, before her career in planetaria, she attended the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point and did research at Texas A&M with the Cryogenic Dark Matter Search and also research at the Kitt Peak National Observatory in Arecibo with her home institution. <coughs> Paulette has dedicated her life and career to helping people get a better understanding of science and the universe. And she also spent Saturday hanging out with the Nobel Laureate. And more than just Saturday, too, I believe. So, without further ado, I give to you, Paulette Epstein. Thank you, Dave. Nobel laureate Dr. John C. Mather came and spoke at the Science Center, but he was there for our annual gala. So I got to spend Thursday night with him, Friday night with him, and Saturday morning. So it was really, really interesting to get to know him a little bit better. Um, he's the one that's working on the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, he's the lead scientist for that. Uh, but yes, as Jonathan said, I went to the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point uh, and did four years of research. Uh, one of my research groups that I was working with, we were uh, studying the light curve of an asteroid called Tim Hunter. Uh, another research group that I was working with, uh, we were taking isolated face-on spiral galaxies and trying to figure out how they evolved over time. And I also worked with the cryogenic dark matter search at Texas A&M for a semester. And that's what I'll be talking about with you guys this evening. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about dark matter and then my research at Texas A&M. Um, and uh, I'll let I was basically building dark matter detectors for the summer, so maybe a little bit different than uh, louder. Sorry about that. Okay, so dark matter. We'll talk a little bit about why it's needed, what is it, the detectors, the, um, different types of detectors, and also how uh, the detectors that we used at CDMS, uh, the, and then how I created those detectors that we were using. Um, so dark matter. Uh, why did we need it? Well, we knew a lot about gravity uh, from Isaac Newton. And we knew a little bit about general relativity because of Einstein. Um, so basically, Einstein told us that gravity actually worked because it bent space and time around it. So when we take a look at our solar system, everybody see that in here? Awesome. Okay, so when we take a look at our solar system, we are actually able to see that the further away from the sun that you get, the further away that, that you get from the center of mass, the slower that these things, uh, the, the slower the orbital, orbital velocity of our planets. So basically, here's the equation right next to it. Um, we were, we, we expected to see that all throughout. Uh, the, the universe even. So we saw that within our solar system, but when we took a look at galaxies, we predicted that the velocity would slow down just like this, but Vera Rubin actually observed that the velocity as you go further out from what looked like the center of mass of the galaxy, um, the velo orbital velocity actually did not slow down. Um, and so we looked at that and we went, huh, okay, that's weird. Why is that happening? Well, we also can take a look at things with gravitational lensing. So that uh, general relativity where gravity, gravity bends space and time around it. When you look at an object with mass that you can see right here, there we have our object with mass, there we have a star that's behind it, and you'll actually see that bent around in two different locations around it. Well, when you take a look at something like a cluster of galaxies like this, we were seeing galaxies being bent around when we weren't expecting them to be, because there wasn't enough mass to actually bend the space and time around it, um, enough to be able to see six versions of this galaxy. So we've actually got like one right here, one right here, one there, one there, um, and it's sort of being whipped around it. So again, we looked at that and went, huh, okay. Interesting, what's going on? And then we take a look at something called the bullet cluster. So the bullet cluster is actually two separate clusters of galaxies. You can see this one right here and that one right there. 
And these two separate clusters of galaxies went through each other and interacted with each other. Now the interaction that we were able to see and um, basically the material that we were able to see is this pink that you see right here. This is actually x-ray light. Um, but that's not where we were actually seeing the gravity itself being concentrated, the mass itself being concentrated. We were seeing the mass concentrated in these blue parts right here that's been superimposed on top of that picture. Um, so all of these sort of came together and we're like, all right, okay, then we need something to explain all of this. So it has to have mass because it interacts gravitationally, um, but we can't see it. So we call it dark matter. Dark because we can't see it, matter because it has mass. Now, what is dark matter? We're not really sure what dark matter is. Um, so if you came here today to find out what dark matter is, I'm sorry, I'm not going to be able to answer that question, but I can tell you a couple of theories about um, what we think dark matter might be. Now, dark matter um, interacts with one of the four, four uh, universal forces. We have the force of gravity, um, which we can see it interacting. We have the electromagnetic force, which would be light, and it doesn't interact that way. Um, so uh, hopefully it interacts one of two other ways. It probably doesn't interact by the strong nuclear force because it would have to get very, very close to something to interact by the strong nuclear force. So we kind of like leave that one out. Hopefully it interacts by the weak force. Um, and if it doesn't interact by the weak force, then well, I don't know if we're actually going to ever be able to directly detect it here on the Earth. So dark matter, uh, as we've sort of calculated, makes up about 23% of our universe. Visible matter, the stuff that we see, makes up about 4% of our universe. And of that 4%, we only have really observed about 1% of that. So we observe a very, very small sliver of our entire universe. 23% of it is dark matter, and 73% of it is something called dark energy that we won't get into today, but it is the reason that our uh, universe is expanding away from us faster than we had expected it to. Um, so what is it? There's a couple of different theories out there. It could be machos, which are massive, compact, halo <coughs> objects. So that's things like black holes, neutron stars, brown dwarves, stuff that we have observed in one way or another, um, but out um, among the halo of a galaxy. And that's not super likely. We do know that galaxies have one if, or have at least one supermassive black hole in the center of them. Ours probably has uh, maybe, maybe even two. Um, but it's not likely that those things are, that there's a lot of those things out in the halo of the galaxy. We would have probably observed one of those by now. Could it be modified gravity? Possible. We may not understand gravity itself. We've been studying it for a long time, but we've sort of discovered new things even recently. Uh, the gravitational waves that we've discovered recently, though they were calculated and then theorized to have to happen, um, we didn't actually observe them until recently. So we may not know everything about our universe yet, um, or at least the, the fundamental forces of our universe. Uh, it could be neutrinos. Eh, maybe. Uh, neutrinos are really, really hot, and by hot, I mean that they move very, very quickly. Um, and they're also very, very small. So for neutrinos to make up the amount of dark matter that we actually see, there would need to be a lot more of them than we've calculated them to be. Um, plus, since they're moving so quickly, um, the mass would be moving around a lot faster than it is than we observe. Um, the last thing that we have on here are weakly interacting massive particles. So these are the things that I was actually trying to uh, help build detectors to detect. Um, and the, they are about 10 to 100 giga electron volts. So that's the mass of these objects. Fairly massive when we're talking about um, subatomic particles. Um, and they only interact by the weak force and the gravitational force. So they would not interact electromagnetically um, as we have not observed that yet with dark matter. So this uh, WIMPs is actually what I was uh, building dark matter detectors to detect, and this is the theory that um, a lot of people think might actually be what dark matter is. But again, we don't really know yet because we've not been able to directly detect it. So we have various techniques to directly detect dark matter. This is actually something called a um, 
cloud chamber. So inside of here, uh, actually underneath this metal plate down here on the bottom, uh, we had dry ice and then we put alcohol on it. Um, so inside of there, it would make a cloud and then we have a radioactive isotope right here inside of there. And you can't quite see it in this picture unless you're looking really, really, really closely at it. Maybe a little bit. Those in the front might be able to see some lines sort of jetting off from that uh, radioactive isotope that's inside of there. Um, so you can actually see the particles moving through that cloud um, with a detector like a cloud chamber. So it would look a little bit like this. You'd see the, uh, the subatomic particles sort of bouncing off and radioactive uh, material bouncing through the cloud. And this is what a drawing of that might look like. Um, you could also use cryogenic detectors, and that's actually what I worked on was a cryogenic detector. We were building um, superconductors on the top of a germanium crystal, and I'll get into that a little bit um, later on. Um, and, and so we'll talk more about cryogenic detectors throughout. Um, and actually, right down the, the hallway from where we were working, uh, there was a xenon detector uh, group that was working, so noble liquids. Uh, they were hoping that a dark matter particle would come in, interact with the xenon liquid, and then they'd be able to see that interaction um, through these photomultiplier tubes that they have on the top and bottom. Um, so they were working just down the uh, way from us. All right, so the detectors at the Cryogenic Dark Matter Search. I worked at Texas a and for a semester, um, and I was building these dark matter detectors. Uh, then this is what they look like. And if you recognize this picture, uh, it might be from a National Geographic article that they used my picture and didn't get any credit. Um, <laughs> yay, being an undergrad, you don't get the credit. <laughs> Um, so, uh, this is one of the detectors that we had created at the Cryogenic Dark Matter Search. So you can see that this is a germanium crystal. This one is only about an inch thick. The ones that they were um, stepping up to were an inch and a half thick instead. Um, and we had built a superconducting microcircuit on the top of this, and there's also another superconducting microcircuit on the bottom of it. Um, so. Uh, we'll actually take a closer look at these uh, superconducting microcircuits in a little bit, but I wanted to show you the process of what I was doing that summer. Um, so I spent my entire summer uh, basically, oh, well, I'll tell you the word uh, in a second. So I'd say I spent my entire summer basically in a clean room, uh, 14 hours a day. Uh, for about six days a week, so that was definitely an, an interesting one. Um, but the dark matter detectors work, hopefully, by a dark matter particle, like this one right here, so there's a wind, coming in, hitting the germanium crystal, and knocking some positive, uh, some positive things that we can measure, and some electrons, um, and then we were able to measure those. So about an inch thick, they're about three inches in the diameter. Um, and knocking the holes up, the electrons down at certain, uh, at, and actually you can see it right here at about tens of kilo electron volts, um, so at certain uh, energy levels. At the same time that that's coming in, vibrations will happen in the germanium or the silicon. We used germanium, they used to use silicon. They, they changed that over slightly before I got there. Um, and then they, that would um, cause vibrations which are called phonons, which would knock apart uh, Cooper pairs in the aluminum collector. Um, and then we were able to measure those Cooper pairs that were, that were created from those phonons or vibrations in the germanium crystal. All right, so building these dark matter detectors, like I said, I was in a lab for 14 hours a day, six days a week. Um, depositing aluminum, tungsten, and silicon on the surface of a germanium crystal. Uh, so this is what uh, was happening inside of, uh, let's see, I'm not quite sure what I get though. Um, so this is what was happening inside of our deposition uh, chamber. There is a, a plasma inside of here, and that plasma bounces up and hits the target. So the target right here is one of those different uh, metals that I was talking about, so it's aluminum, tungsten, or silicon. Um, it, the plasma bump, bumps up, hits that, and then it, it gets pushed down, basically bounces down, and deposits itself onto our, um, onto our substrate. 
So I was depositing, like I said, uh, that one's silicon, that one is aluminum, that one's tungsten on the top of our detectors. Uh, so then we would, oh, there we go. So the process chamber is right here. That's the thing that I had that picture of for you guys. So that, that's where this was happening. Um, we had a couple of advantages over the group that was working at UC Berkeley. Um, they were using a process chamber that opened up into the atmosphere. So they didn't have a load lock right here. This load lock gets pumped down into vacuum. Then there's a like tray inside of here that sort of like slides over into the process chamber where all of that stuff happens and then it slides back out, pumps back up to atmosphere, um, and then we're able to take everything out. At UC Berkeley, they just had a process chamber. So basically anything that went into that process chamber when they were opening it up and closing it back down, like extra water vapor in the atmosphere, extra oxygen, extra nitrogen, um, was going in there and potentially contaminating the substrates. Uh, so they weren't, uh, they were super excited to see the setup that we had at Texas a um, and they were, I believe, going to mirror that at the time. I'm not sure if they actually did. So there's me in the clean room suit. Yes, that's me. Had to wear full clean room gear. Uh, so I had the goggles, the mask, the bunny slippers over my shoes. Um, so it didn't really matter what I wore to the lab as long as I was wearing, you know, hard shoes. Uh, and I. It was a it was a very hot summer in a non air conditioned room uh, in Texas. Jeez. In the summer that it did not drop below ninety degrees, so I had fun. Uh, part of the reason why I didn't go into research and I went into science communication. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, you can actually see me right here putting one of the substrates onto that load lock that that closes, pumps down in the vacuum, everything slides over. Um, and we, we deposit all the stuff on there. So this is actually um, taking a scan of what's happening in the process chamber. So this was telling us what type of uh, contaminants that we had in there. Uh, so we had hydrogen in there, water vapor in there, nitrogen, oxygen, um, carbon dioxide in there, of course, because there was still a little bit of atmosphere in there. Um, you can't pump anything down completely totally to vacuum, um, but we really didn't have very much. So if you can't see this number right here, it is 1 times 10 to the negative 7th tor. Um, so we really didn't have much contaminant in there, uh, and when you look at UC Berkeley's data, they were up at like 1 times 10 to the negative 3, um, so they had many, much more contaminant than we had. Um, so after we deposited everything on the surface, now of course you can't tell the deposition system, hey, deposit it directly here, 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 and here. It deposits it over the entire thing. Um, so we did uh, some photolithography and etching from there. And luckily I did not work in this lab all summer because this one was even worse. We had to wear a rubber suit on top of the clean room suit. Because um, this one we were working with things like uh, piranha, has anyone heard of piranha? It's a fish. It, it is a fish. Um, it's also a chemical combination that will eat any organic material. Um, so uh, we had to be very, very careful with that. We were also using hydrochloric acid and hydrochloric acid, sulfuric acid, all sorts of really fun stuff that I don't like to really touch. That's why I'm a physicist and not a chemist. Um, so uh, when we got to the photolith uh, lab, we put uh, a protective coating on the surface of it, and this was actually um, a UV coating. So if you exposed it to UV light, it would actually sort of disintegrate, but if you did not expose it to that UV light, it would be very, very hard and protective. So then we put a mask on top of it that was in the shape of whatever we wanted it to be, shined the UV light on it, took the mask off, yeah, and then did our etching. So we etched down through several layers um, until we got to the shape and the, the microcircuit that we were looking for. Took off the photoprojective layer, um, and actually we did this a second time too because we, we put more tungsten on top of it as well. Um, so here's some of the stuff that we used in the lab. Um, you can see lots of, lots of chemicals. And, um, I didn't take a picture of the piranha sta um, station though. I don't know why. Uh, 
but this is actually where we would put the substrates in for the UV light. Um, and also notice the, the light is very yellow in this room um, so that it doesn't have UV in it so that we weren't um, making our, our protective layer disappear and we didn't want it to. Um, so while everything was sort of, uh, while everything was going, while I was depositing all of the tungsten and um, silicon and aluminum on the surface, um, and while the, everything was in the photolith and the etching lab, um, of course I had to do research. So what was I doing? I was doing inspection. So I was looking at the microcircuits through a, uh, through a microscope and taking a look at what, you know, what, what, what went wrong? How do we change it? How do we improve? Um, so here are the phonon sensors. Those are the things that I was showing you before on top of the um, on top of the germanium. Um, so each little bubble that you kind of saw before is one of these phonon sensors right here. And so we did this, and then um, after we took it to the lab to do the etching, and we put this tungsten uh, transition transition edge sen sensor on top of it, um, and uh, etched that as well. So it was, a, it was a pretty time consuming process. Um, each one of these took about three days to make. Um, and we did make a lot of mistakes along the way. Um, so if you put your tongs in the wrong spot, you get an open. So we had to make sure that every, every time we placed something <coughs> on there that we weren't uh, scratching off part of the um, superconducting microcircuit on the top. Um, if you didn't it etch properly, you ended up with shorts. So this is actually tungsten and a lot of dirt as well. Um, so dirt was a really big problem. That's why we used piranha, because piranha would eat away the organic material on top of the um, germanium crystal. Um, we also had just bad edges in, in general. <laughs> so like this one right here, you can see there's like no connections at all. Um, so either we didn't deposit enough or we just had a bad etch. Both of those are possible, um, but more than likely, it was probably a bad edge. Um, and then this right here, so this transition edge sensor should be like straight across. And so anytime we saw this, we had another bad edge and we had to redo it. Um, so what, what are the results? So like I said, I worked with the Cryogenic Dark Matter Search City, um, at Texas A&M University. Um, and while I was there, they were also running uh, through the data at, the, at uh, CDMS. And our results are we're really not sure yet. Because in the last about 20 years since CDMS has been running, um, they have found three potential dark matter particles. Three. Three. In the last like 20 years or so. Potential. Potential, right. So, so basically, if they if they are able to um, if they're able to sense something <coughs> with the it's running in the germanium crystal and the phonons at certain energy levels, then maybe it might have been a dark matter particle. And if they sense them both at the same time, it's more likely. But like I said, that's only happened three times in the last 20 years. Um, and unfortunately, that's not statistically significant. Um, so they have not really published any of those results yet. It's really only people inside of the research group that have that, have that information. Um, and I, I, it was actually about two months after I worked on this project that they're like, we found another one. Right? They sent me a text message, and I was like, cool. Still not significant, they're not, still not statistically significant, but cool. Um, so we've, we've estimated that there's about one dark matter particle per every two liters of space. Of course, it's, it's more concentrated in some areas and less concentrated in others, um, but on the Earth, that's what we've sort of estimated dark matter to be. Um, now, because dark matter does not interact anyway except gravitationally and hopefully with the weak force, it's, it's very, very difficult to detect. For example, another thing that's very, very difficult for us to detect are neutrinos. Neutrinos exist and we can detect them, but we only detect a very small percentage of them. 
And if there's only one dark matter particle in every two liters of space, it's going to take a lot more mass and a lot more, uh, a lot more detectors for us and maybe even more time for us to actually be able to um, detect these dark matter particles. So they're improving the current designs. Like I said, while I was there, they were going from the one inch to the one and a half inch. Um, and then they're increasing the, the size and the mass of the detectors just in general. Um, oh, one thing that I forgot to mention. Um, so with this cryogenic dark matter search, uh, this is really, really deep underground. Um, so that it can block out basically any cosmic rays or anything that might not be, uh, that, that is definitely not a dark matter particle, but might interact with the uh, germanium in a way that we don't want it to. They also lined the inside of the, the housing that they put it in with old lead, because lead is radioactive, uh, but the longer that you let, let lead sit, the less radioactive, of course, it's going to be. So. Um, they, they align the inside of that with old lead and then they put the detectors inside of there. Um, so they're increasing the mass and the size of the detectors and improving current designs. Um, they actually went from one microcircuit design to another microcircuit design also while I was there. So that was kind of stressful as well um, because they were trying to um, do something new that they hadn't been doing before. So, does anyone have any questions about this or Yeah. Uh, what was the magnification or what was the physical size in those uh, microscope photographs that you had? Like how big, how big is that sensor? Yep, so um, phonons are vibrations in the germanium crystal. 
Um, and then Cooper pairs are, um, okay, so Cooper pairs in a superconduct, in superconducting aluminum, so when it's really, really cold, all of these are, are kept at, at cryogenic levels, so very, very cold, liquid nitrogen, liquid helium levels. Um, when aluminum is kept at that level, um, when it vibrates, it knocks apart something called a Cooper pair, um, and you're able to detect those. Yeah. Are radioactive sources or uh, particle accelerators better at generating those? So we actually haven't, that we know of, um, created a dark matter particle in one of our accelerators. But it's also very hard for us to know because we can't directly detect them yet. So the energy is 10 GeV about, right? B between 10 and 100, yeah. Um, so we haven't detected anything, but it would have to interact a certain way, and we haven't we haven't been able to detect that yet. Um, and we also don't know like if we put one of these inside of a particle accelerator, is it going to interact with all the other stuff that's being thrown off at that same time? And that's very very possible for that to happen. Um, so that's why we put them really, really deep underground. Um, I actually talked to the, the Ford Club banquet the other night, and someone asked me, why don't we put these in space? Um, because they think that there's more dark matter in space than there is on the Earth. Dark matter is everywhere. It's all around us. Um, but uh, it is more concentrated in some areas. The, uh, the, the thing about putting it in space, though, is that there's way more things that could potentially interact. So we put it way deep underground so that it won't interact with the um, cosmic rays and all of that stuff, or at least most of it's going to be blocked before it gets there. Um, and until we're able to isolate what dark matter is, um, I don't think we'll be able to try and detect it inside of a uh, particle accelerator yet and see if we can actually produce it. Yet. I do. Give it another 20, 30 years, maybe. Um, you know, I so I work at the Michigan Science Center. I am the, I think at this point, my title has changed so many times, I don't even know what it is anymore. Uh, I, I run um, most of the internal education programs at the Science Center and uh, at the planetarium as well. So we have a show in the planetarium where we talk about dark matter. We talk about dark matter with some of our, even some of our youngest guests that come in. Um, and I tell them, you know, dark matter is stuff that we can't see, but we know that it's there. Um, and it's probably going to take the next generation of scientists to figure out. Um, and it might even be the next generation after that, but I'd like to give them a little bit of hope that it's going to be the next generation to figure that one out. Do you have any other questions? John? Um, have any of the candidates for dark matter been knocked out of contention yet? Like, I think that, like, machos were sort of on their way out. Yeah, machos are, uh, I, I only mentioned them because they're, in, in 2011, when I, you know, first did my research, they were kind of thought of to maybe be a uh, dark matter, but at, at this point, I don't think it can be, because we, we would have, at, at least within our own galaxy, detected things like that. Um, like gravitationally, we would have been able to see black holes if they were just hanging out at the, in, in the halo of our galaxy. Um, so I think they've been pretty much pulled out of contention, but I still put them there just in case. Modified gravity, super unlikely, but still possible. Neutrinos, very, very unlikely and have been like completely knocked out, but still not impossible. So I like to I like to put things in there even if they've been sort of moved out of the way, um, just because it's it you, you never know um, what could be real and what couldn't be. So I mean we didn't think gravitational waves were a thing until we found them. So any other questions? No? Any other questions? Yeah. You mentioned. Uh, possibility of it being concentrated in some areas more than others. Uh, what, what can, you, can you break that down a bit? Like where would it be more concentrated or is that just uh, relatively speaking? 
So we, we've, we believe that um, dark matter is more concentrated in areas where there is regular matter. Um, and it's, uh, the, the dark matter that we, we expect there to be, uh, we think that it kind of like follows that cosmic web that we see of, of galaxies. Now, what was there first, the galaxies of the dark matter? We don't know, but uh, they, there's actually a theory out there that the dark matter sort of pooled in those areas and concentrated in those areas, and then the galaxies formed because there was more mass, more matter in those areas. Um, so basically around galaxies, it tends to be a little more concentrated, and then between galaxies, it's much, much more spread out. So we're talking about larger uh, conglomerations of matter, uh, but not like individual stars or, or star clusters or something like that. Right, and at least that we've seen so far, yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if uh, dark matter can consists of, uh, the universe consists of 23% dark matter, mm -hmm. and regular matter tends to coagulate or to concentrate, and at some point, gravity <coughs> pulls it together and forms, uh, uh, starts fusion reactions, so it starts a star. Why doesn't dark matter do something similar? There seems to be, I mean, there's like eight times as much or seven times as much of it, so. You know, that's a good question. Okay. <laughs> and, you know, the, the, so the, the short answer is I don't know. Um, the long answer is dark matter doesn't seem to interact with anything, including itself, other than gravitationally. Um, but, but gravity is what forms the star. Right. But it also, you know, the, um, it also forms, so, so matter starts to, yes, condense down, but then you've got the nuclear force happening, you've got the weak force happening, right. you've got the, the electromagnetic force happening, and we, we haven't found dark matter to interact in any way, even with itself, other than gravitationally. So there might be a force out there that we don't know anything about. It's possible. I mean, we've, we've found particles that we know nothing about. Um, and we're, we're only there mathematically until recently. Um, so who knows exactly what's going on with dark matter? Um, but the short, I guess, I don't know, but we've observed that it, it doesn't even interact with itself other than gravitationally. Comment on that? Yeah. I, I think uh, if you think about the nebular hypothesis, you start with this huge cloud of dust and gas with dark matter mixed in. But as our speaker was saying, there are interactions between those dust and gas particles that the dark matter particles would not have. Collisions, right? Which means electromagnetic forces at play that, that gradually and, and other stars shining on that dust and gas that would exert forces on it due to solar wind, <coughs> uh, stellar wind, and uh, uh, light pressures, all that will gradually concentrate that dust and gas to where it can uh, gravitate and contract and form stars and stellar systems. None of that happens to dark matter. It's got gravity, but nothing else. Yeah, exactly. What, what about uh, black holes? Then? Wouldn't it be attracted and couldn't get out of the black hole? <laughs> uh, maybe. <laughs> you think? Um, it make it black or it dark and black. So, so it, <laughs> well, I mean, if it's a, so it is interacting gravitationally. So it would be it would be attracted and pulled into a black hole and not able to escape from there. Um, but I guess, how do we observe that? We can't really observe that because we can't really observe dark matter except for the fact that it's... Well, the black holes would be bigger than we, we could account for. Right, or more yeah. Massive. Right, if, if, if we were observing that. <coughs> so to that point, um, 
do we see any different distributions of dark matter? And like, if you look at rotation speeds of different galaxies, do you see different distributions? Like, do you see more? Is it the same amount of uh, conservation of angular momentum uh, in all galaxies, or is there some kind of if difference there, between them? If there's a variation, it's very small. It's about five times, the, the rotational speed is about five times what we would expect it to be. Um, and so, uh, there might be some slight variations on that, but for the most part, it's, it's pretty much five times. Yeah? I think it's interesting that um, the dark matter clumps radially from, radially from the center of the galaxy in such a way that the velocity, the, you know, the estimate of velocity constant, you know, go out uh, in the center of the galaxy. Yeah, so... That's well, something in classical physics, you know, one could, could, could use to figure out just exactly uh, yeah. what, 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 what some of the dynamic processes are. Right. Well, that also kind of means that the distribution of dark matter throughout the galaxy is, is basically the same-ish. Um, through the galaxy itself. Um, so maybe that indicates it's just not something at all. Yeah. Just, just like you mentioned, there's no way for it to come. Right. It's just a gravitational force. Yeah, it's just a gravitational force. But it does it does come together a little more in some areas versus others. So um, like when you look at the cosmic web as a whole, we we expect it to be basically following those filaments of the cosmic web and having less in some areas. So it's only interacting gravitationally. It's not going to come together quite as quickly as um, regular matter would have. Uh, yeah, okay, we're seeing the stuff. Uh, uh, okay, we, we have the outer arms that will change too fast. We have the gravitational and think there's got to be something there. It's a mass that's you know, causing this phenomena. It's like it's an inconvenient phenomena. And so we're we're trying to make the 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 find some kind of you know matter there that may not really exist, you know, to fit the theory rather than you know, just looking for it on its own merits. You know what I'm saying? Well so there's there's a lot of um like I've heard the theory that it's uh, there really may not be any any so-called dark matter, <coughs> other than you know, black holes that you know wouldn't account for, you know. But I mean, it, it just we just we we are we're, we're trying to model, you know, we've got to kind of ask backwards, you know, trying to model the the uh, the the the, the, uh, the 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 data to fit the theory rather than the other way around. Right. They, like I said, we could completely and totally misunderstand the laws of physics. It's possible. Because um, we only understand the laws of physics and the reference and and everything that we see it. Um, but, like, this, uh, like I said, this was about a factor of five. The rotation of the galaxies is about a factor of five. The gravitational lensing, the mass that it would take right here to actually do this gravitational lensing is another factor of five. Um, so there's a lot of different things that are happening independently as well that point us to it also being something there that we just can't see. Um, but again, I'm, I'm not saying, no, we 100% we, we understand the laws of physics because yeah. they've changed. Um, they've changed over time. And, and um, though, though Newton has his, had his ideas, Einstein had his ideas, it's possible that we just don't get it yet. And, and uh, my four-year degree would leave or not. <laughs> Something. Yeah, it is possible. Any other questions? Can we go back to that diagram that shows the that's the one right there. So what we're saying here is you're looking at this galaxy, and on the outside of the galaxy, it's moving at virtually the same speed as it is in the middle of the galaxy. That's mm -hmm. what we're saying, right? Mm -hmm. Somewhat like a phonograph record or something. Like that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And where where we would expect it to do something sort of like our solar system does, where it slows down as it goes slows down further out. So this is a, this is a uh, Yeah. So. Go ahead. Just a comment. Uh, one of the major uh, 
new pieces of technology that that will be online here in 2020, I think. The LSST, those are two of its major mission goals: is better understanding of dark matter and dark dark energy by making thousands and thousands of measurements of things that we only have tens of now, like microlensing and uh, and the speeds of, of galaxies and so on and so forth. So that's one of its intent is to learn more about these things. Um, yeah. Question for you. The, um, go back to that galaxy, uh, picture of the Milky Way. Okay, so it's rotated like an LP. Is there a a certain range of speeds that galaxies rotate? Do they all rotate the same speed? They don't. No. Okay, so it does does this limit, is there a, a limit on how fast a galaxy can rotate before it flies apart? Yes, um, but that is the, the speed at which it can, the velocity at which it can rotate before it flies apart is a lot larger than we would expect it to be without yeah, more mass, without that mass, matter there. That's the mass, because of yeah. gravity, we don't know. That. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, just Point of clarification: it, it doesn't rotate as one solid mass. Does it? The velocity? No. The velocity of the stuff halfway out is going the same speed as the stuff all the way out. But it doesn't have to go as far to go all the way around. So it's still going to go around faster. It's just still not as dramatic as the solar system is. No, it's it's actually so it's the same angular velocity. Right. The physical velocity of okay. the galaxy is much, much, much larger than the Okay, so it is angular velocity. Yes, it's angular velocity. Right. Yeah. Because yeah. 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 otherwise. Way, you might have to explain what an LP is to some of the young people. I'll show you a record player sometime. I was going to say, I might be the youngest one in here, and I know what an LP is, so we're good.
Well, there's a very rare event tonight where I'm going to the Rack and Cody Tavern after the meeting. Oh my goodness. I know, it's <laughs> you much must, more rare than a blue moon. You must be through with your finals or something. I'm done with this. No, I actually start my next semester tomorrow, but I have to go to the airport at midnight, so I'll stop at the Red Coat for an hour. Uh, so those that don't know, after the meetings, we go to the Red Coat Tavern on Woodward. So hope to see you there. Hope you enjoyed the meeting.